Cindy is totally special. I'm not just saying that because she's my kid's sister. She's amazingly pretty, with dark blue eyes and black hair. Mom says that comes from our Irish background and maybe a touch of Spanish blood from when the Armada got wrecked back in... 1588. <sighs> Whatever. She's also bright, with a great sense of humor. When Mom brought her home from the hospital, I was six years old. I remember holding the tiny bundle in my arms, terrified of dropping her and not very happy at no longer being Nubara Uno and the Williams family. Then she looked she opened her eyes and looked up at me. Talk about bonding, I was hooked for life. So now it's close to her eighth birthday, and I'm hunting for that special gift, something that will clearly say, yes, this is for Cindy. I've saved almost all my babysitting money and worn my legs to the ankles, trudging through stores. Nothing's right. Nope, not this... Not that either. Then I see the doll. It's in a second-hand store where I've bought some funky clothes and earrings, and at this minute I'm certainly not looking for Cindy's birthday present, but there she is, propped up on top of a bookcase full of recycled Harlequin romances, slumped over to one side, her legs dangling limply over the top shelf, her clothes dirty and torn, her china face filthy. Little Orphan Annie, I think. But maybe... She is not a doll to play with, I realize, but that's okay. Cindy doesn't play with dolls. She collects them. They sit in a row on a shelf in her bedroom. A Spanish dancer, a Dutch doll, baby dolls, and grown-up costume dolls. Mentally, I wash the face, renew the stuffing in the limp body, and make an exquisite Victorian dress, all lace and tucks, complete with petticoat and frilly underpants. Resurrected in my mind, the doll already seems less abandoned. I wander around the store, picking up a pair of earrings, holding a t-shirt up to my front. I drift over to the bookcase and let my eyes wander up the shelves, pulling out a book, leaping through it, and putting it back. Then I pretend to notice the doll. I look at it, shake my head, look at it again. I'm aware that the owner is watching my performance and cut to the chase. <sighs> I need a birthday present for my kid's sister, I say casually. Nothing expensive. What are you asking for that old doll? Not old, she tells me. Antique. She names a price and my jaw drops. Now, I'm not acting. Cindy's not interested in antiques, I stammer. Then you'd better buy her a Barbie. She turns away with a sneer. She's not into Barbies. She likes collecting dolls. Well, this one is a collectible. Terrible condition, though, I bounce back. Storing is part of the collector's challenge. She stands beside me, looking up at the doll. The bargaining goes on for a while. In the end, I walk out of the store a whole lot poorer, car carefully carrying the doll in a cocoon of tissue paper in an old shoebox. For the next couple of weeks, I work on it in my spare time, which isn't a lot since I babysit Cindy most of the day while Mom sleeps. I wash the doll carefully, patting it dry as if it were a real child. I shampoo and set the hair and mend the torn places in the body, carefully tucking in new stuffing. Fiddliest of all are the clothes. As she sat limply in the second-hand store, I had imaginatively clothed the doll in Victorian costume. Imagination is a darn sight easier and quicker than reality, I realize, as I struggle with the dinky little seams, make the rows of tucking, and apply the bits of lace I've rescued from Mom's box of leftovers. Her hair hasn't responded too well to the shampoo, and I can't tame the frizzies, so I make a flowery hat to quench them. With a pearl-headed pin left over from a corsage to hold the hat in place, she looks fantastic. Practically a living, breathing Victorian young lady. Cindy's face, when she unfolds the tissue wrapping and sees my creation for the first time, makes the trouble and dollars spent 
totally worthwhile. Oh, she says. She takes a deep breath. Oh, Trish, is it really mine? Absolutely. All yours. Happy birthday. We hug. She lifts the doll from its nest of paper and hugs it too. And then she exclaims, Ouch! And puts a hand to her cheek. She takes her hand away and I can see a red scratch. Cindy, I'm so sorry. That darn hat pin! It's okay, Cindy says bravely. But her lip trembles. Mom hurries to bathe her face with a cool, wet cloth and I find a bead to push over the pointy end of the pin. Cindy is all smiles again. What are you going to call her? Mom asks. Her name is Sophie. Cindy says formally as if the doll has already been named. Pretty. What made you think of that? Cindy stares. It's her name! I look at the doll cradled in Cindy's arms and I see her smear of blood on one cheek. It makes her look raffish, like a child wearing her mother's blush. I take the damp cloth and wipe the stain off the smooth china cheek. The dark blue eyes stare blankly into mine. With a jolt, I realize that Sophie looks very like Cindy. The same impossibly dark blue eyes, the same black wavy hair. We all troop upstairs to install Cindy in pride of place in the very middle of the doll shelf. Mom remembers a useless little lace cushion she bought at a church bazaar, and upon this Sophie sits, her back propped against the wall, her skirts spread decorously around her, her feet dangling over the edge of the cushion, her hands neatly folded in her lap. There, she looks like a queen. Cindy backs away, her face beaming. Then we go downstairs to get ready for the party. Six for friends. For the, a trip to the water park and cake and ice cream at the mall. By the time her six frenetic friends have arrived safely back to their parents, Mom has to get ready for work, night shift at a local hospital, and I shoo Cindy into the bath and in bed and collapse myself. Small kids are really tiring, especially when they've OD'd on water slides and cake. The moon is shining fully on my face when I wake up. I didn't close the curtains properly, and a bar of white light blazes across my bed. I blink and wonder lazily if I have the energy to get up and close the gap. Then I hear the voice, an agitated mutter, going on and on. Cindy? I stumble across my room and into Cindy's. Enough moonlight sits across the passage that I can see her sitting up in bed, clutching the sheet and staring across the room. I look around, but there's nothing there but the shelf of dolls. Don't make me! She cries out. I don't want to! Leave me alone! Hush, Sprout. No one can make you do anything you don't want. She can! A bad dream, I tell her firmly. I smooth her sweaty forehead and turn her pillow cool side up and make her lie down again. Her cheek feels hot. Is that the cheek that the pin scratched? Could it be infected? I tell myself not to be stupid, that it was only a pin after all. I sit on the edge of her bed, stroking her forehead until I hear her breathing evenly, deeply. Then I stumble, yawning, back to bed. I had a funny dream. Cindy says over Sunday breakfast. What about? I ask. She shrugs. I don't remember. A horrid voice going on and on. If it happens again, tell it to go away. Tell it you don't have to listen. Okay. Can I have another pancake? Another pancake what? Mom says. With maple syrup. Cindy chuckles. It's a family joke she never tires of. With maple syrup, please? She adds. While Mom sleeps, I take Cindy to the park to fly her favorite kite. We eat lunch at McDonald's, and later, when Mom is awake, she plays snakes and ladders with Cindy while I make macaroni and cheese for supper, my top favorite food. Luckily, Cindy likes it too. Mom doesn't complain and has an extra helping of salad. Go away! Go away! I don't have to listen! Cindy's voice penetrates my dreams. Good for her, I think sleepily. Just before it drift off again, I hear a sound like a soft crash. Can a crash be soft? And then I'm out of it till morning. 
Since Dad died, Mom has had to go back to nursing full time. During the holidays, she's usually in bed by the time I get up. It's almost 9 o'clock when I wake up to shower and then make fresh orange juice and put out the breakfast cereal. I go upstairs again to wake up Cindy. Whoa! What happened here? I stop on the threshold. Every one of Cindy's precious dolls, except for Sophie, is lying on the floor. What did you do that for? Cindy sits up in bed and stares. I didn't do nothing! She shakes her head empathetically. Didn't do anything, I say automatically. I can see she's telling the truth. The dolls don't even look like they've been pulled off the shelf. The way they've landed, I would swear they've been pushed. From behind. Which is crazy. And impossible. <sighs> Breakfast's ready, I tell her. I pick up the dolls one by one and replace them on the shelf. The Spanish dancer has lost her comb, and the Japanese geisha, her fan. I put them aside. I must try to glue them back later, I tell myself. I find I'm avoiding Sophie's blank stare as I arrange the dolls on either side of her. No bad dreams, I hope, I say lightly. Nope. I did what you said. I told her I didn't have to listen. Boy, was she mad. Kids are weird. I think as I go downstairs again to reheat the coffee Mom left after for breakfast. It's a gorgeous day, and as I eat my toast and drink my coffee, I think of possible ways for Sophie and me to spend it. The zoo? What about the zoo? Uh-uh. You want to fly kites again? She shakes her head. Even a great relationship has its down moments. I can feel myself getting irritated. What I would really like to do is hang out with my friends, but they don't appreciate being saddled with an eight-year-old, even one as normally sweet-tempered as Cindy. What do you want to do? I try to iron the snarl out of my voice. Nothing. What do you mean, nothing? You can't do nothing. I don't want to go places. I just want to play in my room. But it's a gorgeous day. Who knows? Tomorrow may be raining. She shakes her head and sticks out her lower lip. I remember a lesson Mom taught me. Compromise. Okay. I'll give the living room and kitchen a quick vacuuming and make something cold for supper. Then, we'll go out. She pushes aside her cereal bowl and runs from the room. I whirl around the downstairs with a vacuum. I make ham sandwiches for lunch and boil eggs and potatoes for a salad for supper. By then, it's almost noon. Time to go! I stop outside the door of Cindy's room. She's sitting on the floor with Sophie in her lap. All right, she says, but she doesn't move, and I realize she's talking to the doll. I promise I'll play with you whenever you want. She waits as if she's listening to a reply. Then she nods. Of course you come first, silly. Time to put Sophie back on the shelf, Sprout. We'll go to the park. I've made sandwiches. Come on, the day's wasting. Don't want to. Her voice sounds different, sort of affected. Cindy, what's gotten into you? She turns her back, ignoring me, whispering to the doll. Something snaps at me, and I tear Sophie out of her hands. Squeezing the stuffed arms angrily, I dump her on the cushion on the shelf. There, stay there, I mutter. I, then I turn around quickly, because Cindy is crying. Not temper tantrum tears, but real ones, welling out of her eyes and down her cheeks. You hurt me, Trish. She wails. But I didn't even touch you. Hush now, or you'll wake Mom. She silently holds out her arm, and I can see. Clearly marked. Red finger marks. Just as if I'd grabbed her heart and pulled her. But I didn't. I stop and start again. The park. Come on, Sprout. Get moving. She sits on the floor and shakes her head stubbornly. Cindy, we had a bargain. You got to play. Now it's time for fresh air and exercise. I can't. What do you mean you can't? She won't let me. I don't have to ask who she is. This is getting out of hand. She's a doll, Cindy. She can't tell you what to do. I force her to her feet, down the stairs, and out of the house. She starts screaming as soon as we're outdoors. Mrs. Donnelly comes from next door, comes onto her porch, and glares at me as if I'm beating my kid sister. I get as far as the corner before I give up. Compromise, I remind myself before between clenched teeth. Look, we'll take Sophie with us to the park, in your wagon, okay? The tears stop. It's as if so Cindy is listening, but not to me. Then she nods. Okay. 
We set off again. I'm carrying the kite and the backpack with our lunch. Cindy pulls the wagon with Sophie sitting in it, her legs stiffly out in front of her. I feel uneasy. Uneasily. That she doesn't approve of my compromise. Stupid, I tell myself. She's only a doll, for Pete's sake. I find us a shady spot under a cottonwood and get the kite started before giving the string to Cindy. It's a perfect day. The kite soars and swoops. It climbs higher and higher, and I can tell Cindy's really enjoying herself. Forgetting. I relax. Then she stumbles and falls flat, both her hands going out in front of her, the kite sailing up and away, trailing its string. I run to pick her up. She's not hurt, and I can't imagine what she stumbled over. The grass is totally smooth. <sighs> Bad luck about your kite, I say. Maybe we can get another one like it. I know it's her favorite. A green pterodactyl. She doesn't seem to care, but instead trots back up to the tree and picks up Sophie. Mommy, I hear her say. I do love you best of all. Truly I do. We eat lunch, and for the rest of the afternoon, Cindy plays with Sophie. It's like listening to one half of a telephone conversation filled with meaningful pauses. I find myself checking to see if Sophie's lips are moving as Cindy listens, nods, and talks back. Kids, I say to myself, what imagination, but I feel uneasy, sort of prickly, on edge. It gets hotter, and great castles of cumulus are beginning to pile up around the horizon. Maybe that's what's making me jumpy. Just the weather. We pack up and walk home. Cindy's so tired she w rides in the wagon with Sophie in her lap, and I haul them both. Nap time, Sprout. I say once we're in the house. This time, I get no argument. Later, I peek into our room and see them both laid out on the bed. Cindy's sound asleep, a faint dew of perspiration on her forehead. Beside her, Sophie's eyes are also closed. As I tiptoe out, something makes me turn at the door. My eye, my heart jolts, and I find I'm clutching the door frame for support. Sophie's eyes are open, and she seems to be staring balefully at me. How can glass eyes be so hate-filled? How can they be open? She's laying flat on her back. Everyone knows how sleeping doll eyes work. I run downstairs and turn on the TV. When Mom wakes up, I'm staring at the screen, watching some dumb soap. I tell her I've made potato salad for supper. Ah, oh, great. I don't know how I'd manage without you, Trish. She hesitates. Is it too much for you? Babysitting... Babysitting Cindy all summer? I could afford, probably, to hire a housekeeper just for a month or so. I stare. What brought that on, Mom? I'm fine. I wonder what a housekeeper would make of Sophie. It's just... She stops again. You would never hurt Cindy, would you? It's just that I saw these great bruises on her arms, as if someone had grabbed hold of her. Bruises? Then I remember the red marks on her arms after I snatched Sophie away. What can I say? That I roughed up her doll and the marks magically transferred? No way. But what else can I say? I let myself get mad that Mom would ever think I hurt my sister. Boy, you've got some suspicious mind. That's really insulting. If you want to know, she tripped in the park while... When she was flying her kite. Lost the kite too, though she doesn't seem to mind. Mom apologizes and that's it. But it makes me think more than I've allowed myself to think of till now. Bruises magically transferred? How could that possibly be? But what other explanation is there? At supper time, Cindy's still asleep and I have to wake her. Then Mom hurries off to the hospital. The thunder clouds are really piling up now and the sky has a dirty yellow-gray look. It's stifling hot, in spite of open doors and windows and the fan going. <sighs> Cindy plays in her room and I let her. What else can I do? But I insist on regular bedtime. She doesn't seem to mind as long as Sophie gets to lay beside her. I'm still up when the voices start. Voices? Uh, nonsense. There's only Cindy up there. I run upstairs, accompanied by a flash of light and a following roll of thunder. You have to play as long as I want you to. No, you're not tired. Wake up, I tell you. Wake up! I turn on the light. Cindy is sitting up in bed, Sophie in her lap. Her cheeks are flushed and wet, her hair tangled, and her eyes are full of despair. Trish, 
I'm so sleepy. She won't leave me alone. Give her to me, I managed to say, and gently, oh so gently, I lift Sophie from her lap and replace her on the cushion on the shelf. Lie down, Sprout. Don't go, she whispers, looking past me at the doll shelf. I won't. Trish, I've got a secret. What is it? She leans against me as I sit beside her on the bed and whispers breathily in my ear. I'm sorry, Trish, but I hate her. I whisper back, me too. Then I snuggle down beside her. Go to sleep, Cindy. We'll deal with it in the morning. She's asleep in a minute, and I lay beside her, staring at the ceiling. Now and then a flash of lightning illuminates the room, and the thunder rolls by. How can I deal with this? I think. I need help. But who can I tell? What can I say? They won't believe me. Even Mom will think I'm crazy. I must have fallen asleep because a sudden crash of thunder jolts me awake, and I realize that Cindy is no longer beside me. I sit up and stare. The lightning illuminates the room. She's on the floor with Sophie in her lap. And now I can hear two voices. She must be getting stronger, I think, and a shiver runs down my spine. You're my friend. You've got to play with me. Now smarten up and play properly. I can't, Sophie. I'm tired. I want to go to bed. No, you don't. I'm in charge, you know. I tell you what to do. The voice is sharp and penetrating. I can feel it like a splinter under my skin. Without thinking, I jump off the bed and snatch the doll from Cindy's arms. I shake her and shake her. Stop this right now. Leave her alone. I scream. I can let the stuffing out of you, I think wildly. I can throw you in the garbage. Break your stupid china face. Then, as I look past the blank stare, the hard blue eyes, I see Cindy. She's still sitting on the floor, but she's being shaken by some invisible force. Shaken so hard that her head bobs back and forth. Oh! She gasps as the breath is jolted out of her body. You're hurting me, Trish. Somehow I control myself, put Sophie back on the shelf, and gather Cindy in my arms. I'm sorry, love. I didn't think... Don't you love me anymore? She wails. I wind my arms around her and hold her tight. I can't answer. I sit on the floor, rock her to and fro, stare past her at the doll on the shelf. Every time the lightning shimmers across the room, the glass eyes gleam. I can't let the stuffing out of you, I think. I can't break you or put you in the garbage or even give you away. What can I do? The thunder rolls away and the house is so quiet, I can hear the water dripping off the leaves outside. Slowly, the night passes and the sky lights. I hear the dawn chorus of birds begin as they slowly awake to the new day. I hold my little sister close to my arms and grieve. What have I done?